Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 27, Feminist Science Fiction. I've hinted at this episode a few times in recent weeks, and for good reason. After all, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, work of feminist sci-fi is also a work of dystopian fiction, which I alluded to in episode 24. I'm speaking, of course, about The Handmaid's Tale. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This story starts earlier. The new wave in sci-fi in the 1960s was in many ways a reflection of the social upheavals in society at the time. And yes, I'm looking at this through a very American lens, or at least Anglo-American. Amid the many societal shifts of that decade was the rise of second-wave feminism, which extended the original feminist movement beyond the fight for legal equality to issues of importance to women, like women in the workplace, sexuality, reproductive rights, and domestic violence. It's no surprise, then, that the new socially conscious sci-fi also came to develop its own feminist voice in that decade. Feminist science fiction wasn't solely a second-wave thing, and of course some women did break into the genre much earlier. You'll probably remember that the book I consider the first science fiction novel, Frankenstein, was written by a woman. And Mary Shelley's mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, is regarded as one of the founders of feminism. But despite this, I don't see Frankenstein as a feminist work. Though some experts argue it is, at the end of the day, Mary Shelley was writing a ghost story. And she wrote specifically about her inspiration, quote, the pale student of unhallowed arts, unquote, in the 1831 edition. Plus, despite some early writings, feminism as we understand it today wasn't really a thing yet. As an aside, though, horror was found to be the most male-dominated branch of speculative fiction in a 2013 poll by Tor Books. Even by today's standards, Frankenstein is a real outlier. Even so, feminist sci-fi did get its start during the first wave in the 19th century. I couldn't really find an authoritative source, but the earliest work listed by Wikipedia as a clear example of feminist science fiction is the 1881 novel Mizora by Mary E. Bradley Lane. Mizora is part of the movement of quote-unquote utopian fiction of the late 1800s, which in some ways was a proto-dystopian fiction, but it still had that pre-World War I optimism about it. It tells a tale of a female-only society in the far future, which possesses advanced technology, where men are no longer needed to produce children and have long since been gotten rid of. This book was followed by many other utopian novels by women authors, which portrayed either an all-female society or one with gender roles reversed. New Amazonia, Unveiling a Parallel, The Sultan's Dream, Herland, and more. All this largely fell by the wayside during the pulp era, though. As I've described before, the pre-World War II pulp era was very masculine, the protagonists usually being larger-than-life men. However, there were some female leads and women-centered stories by both male and female authors in that time. Most of these stories did not become famous, but one interesting case comes from John Wyndham of The Day of the Triffids and Village of the Damned fame. Early in his career, he wrote The Venus Adventure, which was published in Wonder Stories in 1932. This story portrays a future where children are born from artificial incubators, and women have entered the workplace in large numbers and achieved equality all the way up to the advanced sciences. The timing of this story is fascinating. The very same year that Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World, showing the horror of a future where humans are manufactured on an assembly line, Wyndham portrays that same technology as a positive good that liberates women from their societal role in pregnancy and child-rearing. It's a very New Wave idea decades before the New Wave even began. After the war, women continued to engage with the genre, paving the way for the coming feminist wave, although not always in obvious ways. Many women writers of this time used male pseudonyms in the hopes that it would give them a leg up or shield them from scrutiny in a very male-dominated genre. This is disputed by some. Eric Leif David compiled a list of over 200 women sci-fi writers prior to 1965 in his book Partners in Wonder, and he reports that very few of them tried to conceal their gender. I've put a link to the archive.org copy of his book in the description, which is free to view if you have an account. I think. 
However, the fact remains that several of the big names did write under pseudonyms and or initials. Catherine Lucille Moore wrote as C.L. Moore and published a number of stories under that name, although she did most of her work co-writing with her husband, Henry Kuttner. Together, they wrote a number of notable Golden Age stories, including Mimsy Were the Borogoves and Quest for the Star Stone. And they wrote the first version of the song The Green Hills of Earth, which was later adopted by Robert Heinlein. Another notable pseudonym came from Alice Mary Norton, who wrote primarily under the name of Andre Norton. She wrote a number of sci-fi and fantasy novels, and was particularly known as one of the earliest major authors of children's sci-fi, alongside Heinlein. More on her in the next episode. But the most notable example of this trend was another Alice, Alice Bradley Sheldon, better known even today by her pen name, James Tiptree Jr. The Tiptree pseudonym successfully remained protected from her fiction debut in 1968 until 1977, in part because it was believed to be protecting a member of the intelligence community, which was kind of true. In World War II, the then Alice Bradley rose to the rank of major in the United States Army Air Forces in the Photo Intelligence Group, basically reading and interpreting photos from spy planes. This was after two abortive attempts at a career first in painting and then in journalism, so she was definitely well-traveled. After the war, she and her husband both worked for the CIA for several years. However, by the time she started writing, she had gone back to school to get a degree in experimental psychology and adopted the pseudonym to protect her academic career. As James Tiptree Jr., Sheldon's first story, Birth of a Salesman, was published in 1968 in Analog. In the following decade, she hid her identity very well whilst being well acclaimed for her writing, to the point that noted author Robert Silverberg not only scoffed at the notion that Tip Tree was female, but also compared her favorably to Ernest Hemingway. She was found out in 1977 after mentioning her mother's death in a letter, leading fans to dig up the obituary which seems like quite a feat before the internet era. Sheldon's works often approached the tone of the pulp fiction she read in her youth, but with more philosophical themes like death, free will, sexuality, and of course, feminism. She wrote mostly short stories, and while she did have a couple of novels, what are probably her two most famous works, which showcase all of these themes very well, are among her short fiction, The Screwfly Solution, and Houston, Houston, Do You Read? The Screwfly Solution, written under the name Raccoona Sheldon, derives its title from a real-world technique used to eradicate parasitic screw flies. It tells a tale of the world collapsing into a terminal epidemic of sexually motivated murder of women. This plague is eventually revealed to have been deliberately introduced by aliens to wipe out humans and take over the Earth. Very dark stuff but a clear melding of all of these major themes of Sheldon's writing. Houston, Houston, Do You Read, on the other hand, is more of a callback to the first wave stories about female-dominated societies. Three male astronauts accidentally time travel to a future where all men were wiped out by a plague, and the few surviving women rebuilt society via cloning. It's a seemingly utopian society, but it takes a dark turn for the men as they learn that this society has no place for the violent tendencies of masculinity. Which, honestly, I don't buy it. I don't want to just say that the resolution feels wrong on its face, it's more substantive than that. For one, I would point out that there are multiple ways in which the story doesn't match our modern understanding of gender. But that's a whole other rabbit hole that we don't have time to go down. Instead, I'll point you to a review of the story by Sable Aradia on Worlds Without End as a place to start where she posits that Sheldon may have been going for a more nuanced view than the misandry that a surface-level reading might suggest. However, while Sheldon was first published in 1968, these two stories are both from the mid-70s, not quite the start of the movement. Honorable mention goes to Anne McCaffrey with Dragonflight, also published in 1968. For all its structural flaws, Dragonflight is very much a story about female empowerment. However, the work that is probably best known for bringing feminist science fiction to the fore is Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness from 1969. Ursula K. Le Guin was the daughter of two notable anthropologists. Her father, Alfred Krober, 
was well known for his work with Ishii, the last member of the Yahi tribe, who was hailed as, quote, the last wild Indian, unquote, in the press. In her youth, the family hosted many prominent guests, including J. Robert Oppenheimer, who became the model for Shevek, the protagonist in The Dispossessed. Le Guin followed in her parents' footsteps, to the extent that she wrote frequently about colonialism and imperialism in her works, alongside feminism and still more themes like Taoism and Jungian psychology. She rose to prominence with two of her early books, The Young Adult Fantasy, A Wizard of Earthsea in 1968, and The Left Hand of Darkness the following year. She would later go on to be the first person to win both the Hugo and Nebula Awards twice for the same two books, The Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed, a feat since tied by Arthur C. Clarke, Joe Haldeman, Orson Scott Card, and Connie Willis, but never surpassed. The Left Hand of Darkness and The Dispossessed are both part of Le Guin's Hainish cycle, in which Earth was one of many planets seeded with human life a million years ago from humans' real homeworld of Hain. Many of these worlds were colonies, but some were in fact genetic experiments, and The Left Hand of Darkness explores one of those. The Left Hand of Darkness plays with gender roles in a way that hadn't been seen before in a major work. The humans of the planet Gethen in the novel are androgynous and asexual for 24 out of the 26 days of their lunar month. Instead of a normal menstrual cycle, for two days each month they develop sexual characteristics that can be either male or female, depending on environmental cues or just random chance. Jen Li Ai, an ambassador from Earth, is sent to Gethen to invite them into the Ecumen, a coalition of human worlds but he finds himself caught up in the local political intrigue instead. Honestly, I found the left hand of darkness to be underwhelming. There seemed to be relatively little connection between the experiment in gender roles and the rest of the plot, and I didn't find that plot all that interesting. And while the book was highly acclaimed and groundbreaking at the time, it did have its critics, including among feminists. Le Guin herself later admitted that the story didn't live up to its potential, with how she chose to refer to the characters with exclusively male pronouns, depicted the androgynous Gethenians as too masculine, and completely ignored the obvious LGBT themes. Even so, I do agree it rates as groundbreaking, and probably qualifies as the first well-known feminist sci-fi novel. If you're going to read Le Guin, though, I would start with The Dispossessed. Where The Left Hand of Darkness was underwhelming to me, I thought The Dispossessed was very good. It's not a feminist work per se, although the themes are still there, but a political thought experiment, and one that Le Guin pulls off surprisingly well. The Dispossessed is the first chronologically in the Hainish cycle, and one of the few examples of modern utopian fiction, to the extent that anything ever is. The book's subtitle is even an ambiguous utopia. The story is set on the planet Uras and its moon Anaris. Uras is dominated by capitalist and patriarchal superpowers with varying degrees of repressive governments. However, to forestall an imminent revolution, Uras gave the colonies on Anaris to the revolutionaries, who built a new society around the teachings of a woman named Odo, a political dissident who not only designed their political and social structure, but also invented a new language for the revolutionaries to use. Thus, Anaris was born as a completely anarchist society. It sounds crazy, but The Dispossessed is the best example I've ever seen for how a functional anarcho-communist society could work, whether or not it would. I should note that the society on Anaris is invariably described as anarchist full stop. However, it eschews private property so strongly that it's clearly meant to be anarcho-communist in theory and anarcho-syndicalist in practice. After all, the language that Odo creates for her new society, Pravik, almost entirely excludes possessive pronouns to try to influence the culture in that direction. Shevek is a brilliant scientist native to Anaris, working on a theory that will eventually lead to the faster-than-light communications seen in the other Hainish books. However, he feels stifled by the political situation on Anaris, the lack of resources there, and the tough requirements of living in that society despite being a true believer in it. Nothing is truly required of people on Anaris, 
It is possible to be a freeloader there, but pro-social behavior is enforced by social pressure and by the various syndicates who control access to the moon's limited resources. Held back by rivals and invited to become a guest researcher on Uras, Shevek chooses to go to the planet to finish his work, the first native of Anaris to do so, which causes great political turmoil. Going to Uras is not forbidden, for nothing is truly forbidden on Anaris as we would understand it, but it's strongly frowned upon and seen as threatening the separation of the two worlds. On Uras, Shevek soon finds that the planet is just as bad as he's been told, really. He finds himself disgusted by the excesses of capitalism, the rigid patriarchal society, and the realization that the nations of Uras will monopolize his discovery for war. So he leaves the university and hatches a plan to avoid that fate. The contrast between the worlds is made even clearer by Le Guin's clever device of writing the two halves of the story interleaved with one another. The book's 13 chapters alternate back and forth between Shevek's present on Uras and his past on Anaris before finally coming together at the end. The whole thing adds up to a very well-crafted piece of literature that really challenges your expectations. Ursula K. Le Guin wrote a number of other notable stories. The rest of the Hainish cycle, including the novella The Word for World is Forest, which is her big work dealing with colonialism, the Wizard of Earthsea series, and The Lathe of Heaven. However, I should spare a few words for one of the all-time most read short stories in the genre, according to the Internet Speculative Fiction Database, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omalas. It's a short piece, and more fantasy than science fiction, but it's one that resonates uncomfortably to this day. Omalas is a paradise, a utopian city where everyone leads happy and fulfilling lives, but with a dark secret. The city's perfect existence depends, in some undefined way, on the continuous torture of a single innocent child. Most of the people of Omalas, for lack of other options, grudgingly accept this state of affairs, but a few cannot and walk away. It's hardly an original idea. Le Guin encountered it as a thought experiment posited by psychologist William James, and unbeknownst to her, Dostoyevsky did the same thing even earlier in The Brothers Karamazov. But by writing it as fiction instead of an abstract dilemma for philosophers, Le Guin gave it far more staying power. The allegory for much of how the real world works is easy to see, especially when you remember her critiques of colonialism. It's also had a number of later works seemingly inspired by it, with a particularly clear example in the Doctor Who episode The Beast Below. Now, I can't very well talk about feminist science fiction without mentioning The Handmaid's Tale. The Handmaid's Tale is Margaret Atwood's famous novel about a dystopian future in which a patriarchal, pseudo-Christian military dictatorship has taken over the United States. I say pseudo-Christian because while the sons of Jacob claim to be Christian, they violate important Christian teachings and hunt down and kill small-o Orthodox Christians wherever they find them. The revolution in what is now known as the Republic of Gilead was partly triggered by a catastrophic drop in fertility and rise in birth defects among the populace, which was caused by pollution and radiation. In response, and in accordance with their patriarchal views, the sons of Jacob forbid women from working or owning property, and they create the institution of handmaids, young women who are forced into service to help usually rich, infertile couples have children, based on a bastardized reading of the biblical story of Jacob and his wives, and, no joke, the Communist Manifesto. You probably know the story, at least from the ongoing Hulu series, if not the book. But for more information, I've actually written two blog posts about The Handmaid's Tale, delving deeper into what it's really saying. To summarize, The Handmaid's Tale is an interesting case when it comes to feminist sci-fi, because Margaret Atwood, when she wrote it, didn't mean for it to be overtly feminist nor political. It's acquired feminist and political readings in the intervening 30 years for obvious reasons. However, Atwood's original intent was a more abstract exercise in dystopian fiction. How could a dictatorship of any kind come about in America today, or rather in the 80s? And her answer is, it would come carrying the cross. It would reach for those authoritarian threads that are already present in society, especially the legacy of the Puritans. It would use the trappings of the religious right. 
But the Sons of Jacob were not a parody of the religious right, but an amalgam of many repressive regimes around the world, past and present, adapted to the American politics of the time. There's a lot more to it. It's a much more detailed discussion than I have time for here. Links to my writings on the book in the description. I do want to note an interesting coincidence in a lesser-known novel. One year before Atwood published The Handmaid's Tale, an author and linguist named Suzette Hayden Elgin wrote a book called Native Tongue. And in Native Tongue, America has also fallen into a repressive patriarchy after women were stripped of the right to vote in 1991, something Elgin framed as an extrapolation of the failure of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1982. And in Native Tongue, again, women's reproductive rights are strictly curtailed. In this case, they are subjected to eugenics to breed the perfect female translators for communication with space aliens. But in doing so, the repressive government has sown the seeds of its own downfall, as those same brilliant female linguists it created are developing a new language called Laadan, which is specifically designed to help women communicate their thoughts, influence the culture in a more feminine direction, and eventually break free of male dominance. But Elgin did one better than Le Guin did with Pravik, and actually created Laadan in real life. There are materials available to learn to speak it, and a few people have. Laadan is really interesting as a constructed language, too. It has influences in both English and Navajo, about which Elgin wrote a dissertation. Each. It's a tonal language, so the ah vowel is mandatory. Its vocabulary is engineered to focus on ideas Elgin considered to be of relevance to women. In addition to specific vocabulary, sentences are required to be marked in the way nouns and verbs normally would be for evidentiality, that is, whether the information is trusted, and for what amounts to grammatical mood. You know what? This is going to need a companion blog post. It's too complicated to get into the intricacies of constructed languages here and Laadan is one of the more carefully constructed languages in the genre. Actually, there's a thought. Maybe I could do a special edition of the podcast talking about conlangs in science fiction. After all, there's a lot of them. There's George Orwell's Newspeak, Robert Heinlein's Speed Talk and Martian, Samuel R. Delaney's Babel 17, Klingon, Heptapod, Navi, and more. But for now, I'll just put some links to interesting discussions about Laadan in the description. Unfortunately, Laadan never caught on. Elgin considered the whole thing to be a social experiment and set a timeline of ten years to see if a language by and for women would gain traction. The feminist community seemed completely uninterested. She contrasted this with Klingon, a highly quote-unquote masculine language that gained an enormous following over that same decade, although Klingon had a few other things going for it. Still, even with this failure, Elgin took it as a positive. If women were uninterested in Laadan, she said, then they don't find human languages inadequate for communication in the first place. One other very important feminist sci-fi writer was Octavia E. Butler, who was recently honored by giving her name to the landing site of the Mars Perseverance rover. Octavia Butler, as a black woman who grew up in California in the era of segregation, was one of the biggest names to write about the experiences of women of color in science fiction. In that respect, you might call her third-wave feminist, doubly so because her most famous books were published when intersectional feminism was on the rise in the 90s. But she got her start well before that. In fact, she started writing science fiction in elementary school, and at age 10 begged her mother to buy her a typewriter. Despite the challenges of breaking into the genre as a black woman, she persevered, got an arts degree, and attended writers' workshops, where she soon befriended Harlan Ellison and Samuel R. Delaney. Today, Butler's best-selling novel is Kindred, one of her earlier works in which a black woman finds herself shunted back and forth through time between her modern life in 1976 and the slave plantation where her ancestors lived in 1815. It was highly acclaimed at the time, including by Ellison, However, what made her most famous in the moment was her later 1993 novel, Parable of the Sower, and its sequel, Parable of the Talents. Parable of the Sower could have fit in the episodes on dystopian fiction or environmental collapse. It's set in a then-future California in the 2020s, 
that has been ravaged by climate change and a crumbling social order. The protagonist, Lauren, is a black teenage girl who suffers from a newly diagnosed mental disorder called hyperempathy, which causes her to experience any pain she sees in others as her own, not telepathically, rather as a psychological reaction. She initially lives in a gated community, which by that time is a near fortress protecting its residents from the poverty and violence outside. But eventually, it's overrun by outsiders, forcing Lauren and a few other survivors out to walk the roads, looking for safety. Honestly, it sounds like Mad Max meets Snow Crash when I describe it like that, but it's really not. The themes are quite different, and in an idiosyncratic way, much more spiritual. The thematic heart of the story follows Lauren as the founder of a new religion that she calls Earthseed. Its central tenet is, quote, God is change, unquote and that believers can quote-unquote shape God by shaping themselves and taking control of their own lives. And it also holds an optimistic view of humankind's destiny being to spread to the stars. It's a complex idea that you really need to read for yourself. And phew, this is a much bigger topic than I'd bargained for. That's what I get for trying to fit the entire subgenre of feminist sci-fi into one episode. I haven't even touched newer works like Ancillary Justice, Annihilation, or The Calculating Stars. There's a lot of good stuff that's come out in recent years, both from women writers generally and feminist sci-fi in particular. But this episode is already running long, so I think I'll have to leave those for another time. I will note that there are plenty of resources if you want to explore this topic further for yourself. And there are a lot more women in sci-fi than you might think of off the top of your head. Mary Robinette Kowal, author of The Calculating Stars, can rattle off a dozen women sci-fi authors when asked for recommendations, something she started doing consciously when she realized that most of the big-name recommendations were for men. I've included a link to her thoughts on the matter, which includes a long list of women in sci-fi compiled by Sandra MacDonald. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can also find me on YouTube and at my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com. My book recommendation for this episode... I feel a little bad going with The Dispossessed because it's kind of the least feminist book on this list, but I'm going with The Dispossessed. I mean, it's by no means unfeminist, but that's not its main talking point. It's just really good, and you should definitely read it. Also, if you have ideas for new topics I can cover in this podcast after we finish the chronological series, like Constructed Languages, leave a comment. The next episode will be the last one discussing the new wave. It's been a while, hasn't it? After that, we'll pretty much be done with the 60s, although there are always exceptions. To round out our discussion of the new wave, we will be looking at the new developments in children's science fiction in that era. Thanks for listening.